diversity webinar. Um, we've had a lot of interest, which is fantastic. Um, and I think it just um, shows how um, how important butterflies are and how interested people um, are in it. Um, and it we still just don't know a lot about them. And so this is an opportunity for us to share some knowledge and um, and really, you know, find out what is actually happening around um, the Blue Mountains and Lithgow sort of area and, um, and broader. Um, so before we get into the webinar, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the many uh, parts of this beautiful country that we're meeting on. And I really want to um, acknowledge their amazing and deep knowledge of caring for this um, beautiful, beautiful country. And I think it's really important that we take the opportunity to learn as much as we can from uh, the First Nations people, because unless we understand the relationship between us and country and all the species in it, we're not going to be able to recover threatened species. And so, um, yeah, it's it's really with with a really deep um, gratitude that I acknowledge the the sharing of the knowledge that um, has been happening between First Nations people and those of us that um, want to look after country. Um, today we've got a whole bunch of um, different presenters and it's a really fully packed um, webinar. So we're going to go through and hear from different people and for those of you that have any questions, we'll have a session at the end for, um, for questions. And if you have a question, um, please pop it in the chat function, which we'll go back to later and read them out. Now, the chat function is a little speech bubble that you can see up at the top of the webinar. Um, so pop in any questions to any of the speakers as you go, and um, we'll get to them at the end. Um, now, hopefully we won't have too many technical issues and you all can um, hear and see us at this stage. And um, if if there is technical issues, do pop them in the chat, but it may be a bit difficult for us to fix those um, from this end. So um, as I said, we're recording the webinar and we will share a link to the recording with anybody that's registered, including any resources that um, people might have an interest in. So um, hopefully everything will go smoothly. So um, let's get started. Um, just to start off, we're going to hear from Sian Tower. Sian is a um, local Wiradjuri woman from the Lithgow area and she's going to um, chat to us about um, her knowledge and relationship of the purple copper butterfly. So let me just share Sian's presentation and Cian, if you can unmute yourself, then um, we should be able yes. to hear you. My name is Cian Towers. I am a local Wiradjuri person. Um, my country links uh, stem from Lithgow to Bathurst, and in between there is a place called um, Blackman's Flat. So, and we have some um, history of um, staying on the Macquarie um, as well um, in the early days uh, when we were pushed off country. Um, so I'm also a direct woman of the Blue Mountains um, from the Waimuli mob. So, yeah, I was invited here today um, by Greg. A uh, little bit short notice, but that's okay. Um, I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me, everybody. Um, it's really important to, um, you know, welcome people under country, especially when they're working on country 
um, in, like as in Lithgow local area and surrounding areas to do with purple copper butterfly um, and to speak the language and to sing language on country. So I'm just going to start off with an acknowledgement to um, of you guys to country and I'm going to do it in language um, as a way of country recognising um, what we're doing as well and ancestors. So, Gawain Badahung, Nagin Yalgo Wurajarika Nagarambang, Maini Garang Riging, Hugor Nimde Yan Hagi Wurajari, Indiamara La Maini Galangu, Yanda Garai Bubu Bila Galang. Bu Naga Giri and um uh Gara. So what I've said is that I welcome you all to Wiradjuri country, Wiradjuri. Wiradjuri people are happy that you have all come. And that by giving honor and respect to all people, um, then the land and the rivers will look after us. Okay, so I just think it's really important that we actually come together and sit and talk like this. Uh, we stop, Mabinya, we sit, we be younger, and we learn, Yalbilinya, uh, about country, Nagarambang and butterfly, which is Badya Badya in Wiradjuri. So I'm here today to speak about Badya Badya. Um, just to quickly mention that yesterday I went up to Scotchman's Hill, as everybody knows it, but the local people here know it as Wallaby Rock. So it had been about 20 years since I'd gone up there as a child. I um, Very ceremonial place, and my mother used to go up there as well. And I've been walking around country lately up on the News Plateau and places like that and just looking at the regeneration, the devastation that the fires brought through and the regeneration. Um, that's the way that I've been taking photos and things like that. I just want to note that there's black form um, up on Wallaby Rock and leading up to Wallaby Rock. Um, so it would be nice to um, see if there's some purple copper butterflies around you know, in the next few years when I keep walking that track. So Badya Badya in um, Aboriginal um, spirituality, um, meaning it teaches us about rebirth, it's transformational, creativity, infinite potential, uh, vibrant joy, change, experience, the wonder of life. So by observing the life cycle of the Badya Badya, which is what we're all doing, in and of itself holds rich symbolism and meaning. Badya Badya is about recycling, deep meditation while in the form of cocoon, letting go of old wombs, releasing and freedom. So I'm just bringing this up because while we're on the track of Badya Badya, these are the things you know, that are happening in our own lives by observing these things. Butterflies can carry pollen from one plant to the other. This is about their importance, you know, fruits, veggies, flowers to help produce new seed. Um, so the budja budja is main food source to other living things, so it helps other things eat and carry on in ecology, um, including it being eaten itself in all its different stages of life. Okay, so what I'm saying is the importance of Badya Badya, you know, and why we need to maintain um, its presence um, in our systems today. I mean, everything has a purpose. Everything has its balance. And when one falls to the wayside, you tend to see that it's a domino effect. And I feel that's happening today. So um, you might be able to see a mural that I did, and it's out at the Portland. It's ironically enough on a fire station wall out at Portland. Um, it's a four metre by two metre mural. And so it, it um, demonstrates the life cycle and the relationships involved in this purple copper butterfly um, which we call the uh, Paralusia spinifera. <laughs> so um, I've just got a little bit of reading to do here. So the healthy ecology of the purple copper butterfly 
Um, it's not like this today, although we're anticipating to bring this back. The purple copper butterfly of the Greater Lithgow wider area going on to Oberon, Bathurst, uh, Meadow Flat, Portland, um, 900 metres above sea level. It is a unique um, narrative of reincarnation and dreamtime story, Jakapa, which is Gunyulungulung, uh, the dreamtime story um, of the relationship between the blackthorn bush. Um, which is the caterpillar's only source of food. Um, the plant is being destroyed today and we're here to bring that back, which is a really good gunyolungyolung. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Fire produces the plant's regrowth by small, slow, low burns, which does not happen anymore or doesn't happen very much anyway. We're bringing that back, so that's good, gunyolungyolung. Aboriginal people like the fire that is controlled very cleverly. You know, the ants of this region protect the caterpillar by um, taking the small caterpillar to the ant nest during the day, taking the caterpillar back to the plant at night. The caterpillar then goes into its cocoon, metamorphosizes into a beautiful purple copper butterfly. Oh, they're so gorgeous. All colours of the rainbow, um, almost. The um, purple copper butterfly is an example of reincarnation when it spreads its wings and flies into metamorphosis. The um, butterfly has a relationship with creative spirit, okay, and other living ecology so that the cycle of life and death continues. So that is the most important thing about Budya Budya is it teaches us about the continuation of life and death, the recycling, okay. It teaches us so much. Um, this healthy ecology is being destroyed, as we all know. There for you, um, this creature and its um, plant uh, becoming extinct because Australia's not managed the way that it's supposed to be managed or was managed before. So um, we need to take into account relationships, which is what this painting is demonstrating. So um, we've got the Budja Budja up front centre. The sun represents the creator. The floor represents the, the um, um, mother nature. Um, We've got the black thorn on side to side, but we've also got the fire lanterns, which represent the fire. We've got the spirit of the ancestors that are there. We've got the Aboriginal people who are there, and we've got the ants. So if you were to go out to Portland, you would see that it takes all of those um, living specimens to regenerate the life, to help encourage the regeneration of the life of the purple copper butterfly. So. Otherwise, this, um, this species disappears. And what concerns me is when this species disappears, unsettling the balance of um, life, what happens when you go to heaven and you come back? I mean, I know that not all people understand this concept, but Aboriginal people do believe in the recycling of life. Um, it's like your energy checks in um to heaven <laughs> and then it comes back down purified and as it checks in to heaven um it's like it's like the telling of the story of what's going on up there in heaven so we've got too many um purple copper butterflies dying and becoming well, we 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 put a lot of emphasis on things becoming extinct things don't become extinct in our culture they lay dormant until the time's right for them to recycle again. But it's sending messages to create a spirit that things aren't balanced down here, if you know what I mean. When the cycle is actually acting as it should be, then everything, you know, the food sources are more full, you know. Um, everything is in the right balance and that is so important. So at the moment, the purple buff but a blood, uh, butterfly blah, 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 is laying, laying dormant almost and we are regenerating its um, environment to bring it about again, which is more than important than just our food sources but also on a spiritual level, um, keeping that spiritualness um, active, 
It, it does go more deeper than that, but it's hard to explain because this is years and years and years of um, being told these things, okay? So um, I'm hoping that you're on the right path and understanding what I'm talking about. So um, if we live more in bush type, you know, we take um, notice of the animals, the signs, the seasons, the winds of change, and not so much in clock time. We need to read nature and to do that, Aboriginal people sit and read country, map out country and go into deep listening. Okay. So we need to change ourselves and our way of thinking to keep this butterfly alive. Um, like I said, this is my favourite butterfly. Um, yes, it's in my local area and I feel an obligation to help you know, maintain um, the growth of the blackthorn so that we can encourage this butterfly to come back and the ants to do their job. Um, and I understand that the local land service is also um, rolling out slow burns and things like that. I want to be a part of that um, so I can be a part of this whole gunyalung yalung um, continuing. Um, so I'm really happy um, to have come today. Thank you very much for your time um, being here and all the work that you're going to do about this butterfly. I'm really excited to see. So that's all from me. I'm going to say yarn all. See you all again. Um, let me join up to whatever I need to get involved in this, um, in this work that you are so beautifully doing. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sienne. And it's just such a privilege to be able to um, to work together on, on this beautiful purple copper butterfly. Now, the next presenter um, we've got is um, Susie Bond. Susie's going to be um, talking to us more generally about butterflies. She, um, she's part of Butterflies Australia and is just going to tell us a bit about the butterflies biology and um, the diversity and what sort of trouble they may be in. So thanks, Susie, over to you. Thanks, Ev. All right. Okay, can you guys see the presentation? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Susie, and I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the trust traditional custodians of the land where I'm speaking from today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I also wish to thank uh, Michael Braby and Chris Sanderson, who are also part of the Butterflies Australia project, and also Martin Purvis, who has produced a lot of the really beautiful photos in this presentation. Okay, so this is just a bit of an overview of my talk. I'm just gonna go through what butterflies are, how they're classified, what sort of diversity and distribution we have with our butterflies here in Australia, how many species are listed as threatened, and then I'm gonna finish up with what sort of roles butterflies play in our ecosystems. Okay, uh, so butterflies are insects and both uh, moths and butterflies belong to the order Lepidoptera. And butterflies and moths both undergo metamorphosis or their life cycle. And they start with the eggs being laid by the female butterfly. And these then hatch into larvae or caterpillars. And this is the life stage of butterflies, which is concerned with eating lots and growing lots. They then form the chrysalis or the pupa, and this is the non-feeding stage where all the larval organs are reorganized and then transformed into the adult form and the adult butterfly emerges from the pupa. So the life stage of the adult is concerned with dispersal and breeding. So this entire life cycle can range from a few weeks for some species all the way through to several months for other species. And I just want to highlight that it's really important that when we're thinking about butterflies, we don't just think of the adult, we think of all the immature stages as well. Okay, so here's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, what's the difference between butterflies and moths? So the first generalization we can make is that butterflies 
fly during the day. Moths tend to, but don't always, fly at night. The next is that butterflies tend to be quite brightly coloured, whereas moths aren't. When they perch, butterflies tend to hold their wings closed off their, over their body, but not always. Moths, on the other hand, tend to hold their wings flat or folded over their body. Okay, this is a very hard one to see, unfortunately, unless you've got a specimen in front of you, uh, but it's actually really useful for separating the two. So moths have a frenulum, butterflies don't. This hooks the forewing to the hind wing when, they, when the moths fly. And this last one is the one I think is actually most useful. Um, so moths don't have any clubs at the end of their antennae, butterflies do. Now, these are all really generalized points. They're not hard and fast rules at all. And uh, for example, there's a moth family called the sun moth family. And this family really wanna be butterflies. They have clubbed antennae, uh, they fly during the day. They've got beautifully bright colored wings. So just take this with a bit of grain of salt. These are good generalizations to get started, but not hard and fast. Okay, so insects being a butterfly, they have three main body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. What I'd like you to have a look at here is have a look at the end of the antenna. See how it's got that club on the end? That immediately tells you we're looking at a butterfly. However, with butterflies, we tend to focus more on the wings part of the body, particularly for field identifications and observations. And it's always really good if you can to try and get observations or photos of the upper wing as well as the underwing. And you also need to take note of the forewing patterns and markings and the hind wing. So just thinking about these different aspects of the wings will be really helpful. All right, so now I'd like to introduce you to the butterfly families that we have in Australia. And I'm gonna start with the swallowtails. So these guys are typically large, they're showy, they're brightly colored. Some have some really spectacular long tails. Uh, they have a habit when they're feeding at flowers, they flutter their wings a lot, so they're quite hard to get really good photos of. Next family are the skippers. And these guys are kind of the opposite to the swallowtails. They're, they're small, um, they're dull, they're often overlooked. They, they have colors of creams and browns and oranges and greys. And I don't know if you can see this here, but uh, on this oaky, you can see that the, the club tips to the antennae, they're bent, and this is a, a lovely, typical feature for this family. Next up, we have the Pyrids. These guys tend to be medium sized and they're also a really highly mobile group. So a lot of our migrants and vagrants are from this group and they, they tend to be colored with um, white, black, yellow, and sometimes red markings. Our next family are the Nymphs. These are typically brown and orange uh, and seem to range between medium to large. Uh, then we have the metal mark family. Now we only have one species from this family, um, the Harlequin metal mark from far north Queensland. So we won't talk about that one. And lastly, uh, we have the, the blues or the Lysenids. And, and these are typically small uh, and they come in blues, greys, yellows, bronzes. Uh, quite a few species uh, on the end of their hind wings have tails or dots, and many of the Lysenids also have ant associations. All right, so butterflies are essentially a tropical group of insects. So it's possibly not too unsurprising that Australia isn't particularly diverse compared to the rest of the world. Although we do do a lot better than countries like Britain, which only has about 60 species. Um, so you're going to find the high diversity in the world in, in the tropical countries. And at the moment, Colombia and Peru are competing for the title of the most butterfly diverse country. So our, our butterflies, uh, our most numerous families are the skippers and the blues. Most of our species are endemic, which means that you can only find them in Australia. Uh, the sort of habitats that they prefer are rainforest, then forest and then woodland habitats. So we don't really have that many inland in the deserts. We do have a, a few, um, but not too many. And this results in having quite an uneven distribution uh, in, in their diversity. So Cape York Peninsula is by far the biodiversity hotspot for butterflies in Australia. Then the wet tropics of the Atherton Tablelands 
and then the subtropical forests and rainforests around southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales. So of our 447 species in Australia, how many are threatened? According to our National Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, we have seven species and subspecies uh, that are threatened. But there are a few problems with the EPBC list. Uh, it's not always up to date, and so it's not always completely accurate. And there's often a large discrepancy between what is actually threatened and then what's made it through to this list. So here instead is a list of 26 species that have been identified most at risk of extinction based on expert knowledge. And I would just like to point out that all the species on this list, they're all endemic to Australia. They are all ecosystem specialists and most of them are dependent on just one larval food plant or one attendant ant species. So what's threatening all these butterflies? The major one for most species is inappropriate fire regimes. Now this can be due to either increased or decrease in uh, frequency or intensity of fires. And it's thought in particular that the 2019-2020 the bushfires have actually um, really worsened the outlook for many butterflies and not just the threatened species. The next most important one is habitat loss. This is usually due to a change in land use. And this includes hilltopping sites which uh, a key courtship has habitat for many butterflies at high points in the landscape. Next one is habitat fragmentation, which is often associated with the degradation of habitat and can disrupt things like movement between the fragments for butterfly populations. The next one is invasive species, in particular introduced grasses, introduced herbivores and introduced insects. And lastly, climate change. Now, there, there are lots of unknowns about this, but the main concerns we have for butterflies are likely going to be around increased temperatures, uh, but also the duration and frequency of droughts that are predicted. So why should we be worried about all these threats to our butterfly populations? A part of the answer is that it's because butterflies play really important ecological roles. So the adult butterflies, they provide pollination services due to their need to visit different flowers for accessing nectar. And they also provide important uh, food source for predators like insectivorous birds, particularly during their breeding season. And then also for parasitoids like flies, wasps. Likewise, uh, caterpillars provide an important food source for predators and parasitoids too. Um, but they also have essential roles in the ecosystem due to their provision of herbivory services. And they also cycle nutrients back into the soil from the plants via their feces. Additionally, many of the lysenid caterpillars have these associations with the ant species, where the ants look after the caterpillars in return for um, sweet secretions or honeydew from the caterpillars. Uh, and from, for the last point of my talk, I'd just like to highlight that butterflies can be ideal ecological indicators, um, not just due to their sensitivity to ecological change, but also because of their rapid response to change. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Susie. So interesting. And I have to say, I learned a fair amount on that question about the um, moths and butterflies has occurred in my head multiple times as I'm out and about seeing things and wondering which group they belong to. So thank you so much for that, Susie. Now, next up, we've got um, Sandy Benson from Bush Care Blue Mountains, who's going to share with us a bit about what um, the hilltopping is that um, Susie mentioned and how it's threatened by what people have done to the habitat and also how bush care is helping um, the butterflies recover on that front. So over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, is my screen sharing? Not just yet. Okay, hang on. What? Uh, hang on. <laughs> That's all right. We'll get there. Here we I go. I think it's working this, on it now. This is this is it. Is this it? Hang on. Yep. 
Uh, just plot, um, maybe minimize the. Um, oh, this, the yep. Meter. Yep. Yeah, oh, that one. Yeah. Perfect. Now okay. we can Fantastic. See it. Thanks so much. Right, Sarah. that's that's the IT thing out of the way then. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sandy Benson. I work for Blue Mountain City Council as the Bush Care Team Leader. Uh, I'll be talking about a project that we worked on uh, at Bellevue Park in Lawson and it's um, a hilltopping butterfly project where we've uh, done some work on building some type of structures there but I'll, I'll get onto that a little bit in a minute. So hilltopping butterflies, as Susie had said before, the butterfly populations are in decline locally and globally and it's and it's due to the loss of those breeding sites but also of food sources and in blue mountains hilltopping butterflies such as the blue jewel penciled blue and the copper ant blue under threat due to the loss of, of suitable hilltopping sites now the absence of these sites can lead to the local extinction of uh, butterfly species. Just a moment. Now, a lot of people might ask, what is hilltopping? Well, hilltopping is a place where butterflies come to meet their mates. So it's sort of like the tinder of, of, um, of butterflies. Uh, a butterfly hilltopping site is at the top of a hill where the males of the, the species congregate in spring and summer and wait for, me, for females to turn up. They sort of cruise around um, fighting the other ones off for the best territory near the top of the hill and they're the ones that have the best chances of mating um, with the females that, that come. Once a female's mate, they leave to lay their eggs in host plants that might not be close by but they may have to go a fair bit away and also an area where it's going to provide shelter and food for the emerging caterpillars. The photo that is behind um, on this slide is an example of a hilltopping site in Lawson and Hazelbrook. So this just gives you an idea of what a hilltopping site would look like. Um, now hill, hilltopping species are very particular. So they've adapted their mating behaviour because they have low population numbers. So instead of flying around everywhere, trying to find another uh, partner, they gather at the hilltops and then that way um, they've got a higher chance of meeting a partner. The threats to the hilltopping um, breeding grounds are mostly to do with development. So where Bellevue Park is, is at the top of a hill. It ha it's a fantastic lookout, but unfo and unfortunately for butterflies and for people, we all love those hilltops. We love those hilltops. We love to build there. We love to put our houses there, put phone towers, put roads right through, recreate, and even skate park. So Bellevue Park, that has been known as a hilltopping site, has this skate park in it. So what happens? What happens then? What do the butterflies do for these hilltopping ones? Any disturbance to the site or vegetation can result in males not recognising the site as their hilltopping site, and that could lead to the local extinction of the, of the species. We worked, uh, so the Blue Mountain City Council uh, received a grant from the Greater Sydney Local Land Services. I'm working on um, trying to replicate what the hilltopping may look like. There were, it, it has been known as a hilltopping park, but like I said, we, there's been building on top of it. So we've tried to put some high points into the landscape by placing rocks um, and having them at different levels. The, the high, 
for the higher ones um, are the ones that we're hoping that the that the males will sit on. We've also got some lower ones there as well. We have worked with our community um, to understand what it, what the importance of this site is. We've done some weed removal. Um, also, this this one was a little bit tricky because there are, there is likely to be um, indigenous artifacts in that area. We had to work on top of the soil, so not not dig in. Uh, we, we were planting native veg to, as food sources. Um, yes, yeah, so education is the, is what was one of the main um, reasons why we wanted to make sure that we put this hilltopping site in and, and to let people know how important it is. So um, we had lots of schools that came. So Lawson Homeschoolers, Lawson Public School, and also the South Lawson Bush Care Group. So they've all been involved in this hilltopping project. To help, to help butterflies yourself, uh, the main thing to do is to try and retain your native vegetation on prominent, prominent hilltops or high points where hilltopping butterflies are likely to congregate. And also leave those hilltops as, as is. Don't uh, clear them um, or, or build anything on top. Try and keep those hilltops free. Because, uh, like I said before, if there's any disturbance to those, it can alter whether butterflies will go back to that um, hilltop and recognise it as somewhere where um, they will find a breeding partner. But if you are doing putting in a, a garden of your own, just remember that your plants will provide the sh food and shelter for the butterflies um, to plant tea trees, wattles, rife rice flowers, garnias, and any of the flowering pre, uh, peas, and that'll provide the nectar and habitat for caterpillars and abundant blooms, lots of things that have tons of flowers. So you can mix in um, some, some other plants as well and a variety. So um, not just a large grouping of one, but to mix, mix things, have different flowering times, um, sun, moisture and minerals, so you need all of those things, but also uh, you can retain rocks to heat and they can be really great places for butterflies to bask. Bare patches of damp soil are also a, um, essential as well. And most importantly, just try not to spray them or any other bugs because they butterflies are really, really essential. Uh, the main thing to remember at the end of the day is to protect firstly if you can and then if not plant. So thank you. Thanks so much Sandy, that was so fascinating. I certainly didn't know uh, about the importance of um, hilltopping sites before this webinar. Um, I know it's when when we looked into it, it was the same it was I didn't even know it was a thing so it they are really important fantastic thank you so much um now if you can just hop on to stop your screen sharing um which I think there should be a cross yep that's it beautiful Thank you heaps, Sandy. Um, now the next presenter is Jess Petrie from um, the Saving Our Species program from the New South Wales government. So Jess is, um, I guess, in charge of looking after the purple copper butterfly from a government's perspective. And so she's gonna give us a bit more information about this species and um, how unique it really is and also about an opportunity for everybody involved um, in, in looking for butterflies to start um, becoming part of a citizen science project. So over to you, Jess. Thanks, Ev. Okay. 
share my screen. And thanks everyone for joining in today as well. Um, is that working? Oh, sorry, was that working, Ev? I didn't quite see. Yes, yes, it's working. Yep. Okay, great. Okay. So the purple copper butterfly um, or Paralusia uh, spinifera. There we go. So the purple copper butterfly, it's one of um, Australia's rarest butterflies. Um, and my personal opinion, one of our most beautiful uh, and striking butterflies that we have in Australia. Um, so just to give you an idea, if you've not actually seen one uh, before, that, that butterfly is actually the size um, of, your, of your thumbnail. Uh, so they're really petite butterflies. Um, so commonly referred to as the purple copper butterfly, but it's also known as well as the Bathurst uh, copper butterfly. It's gone by a few different other names as well. The Yethon copper, uh, the copper wing butterfly. It's also been called uh, the Lithgow copper butterfly. Um, it was initially described back in 1978 uh, with the first specimen actually collected from Yethon back in 64. Uh, so it's an endangered species under our New South Wales Biodiversity and Conservation Act, um, and it's listed as vulnerable under the EPBC Act. So I'll first start by talking about its life cycle. Um, so I'll start with the butterfly, uh, considering it's flying right now. Um, so the butterfly, when it's in that stage of its life cycle, uh, it's a pollinator in the system. Um, and butterflies are active generally uh, between late August, to early November. Um, so it's a, it's a pollinator in that system, but predominantly its, it's uh, focus is uh, reproducing. So females will lay eggs on the host plant, the blackthorn, um, and after a period, a short period of time, the eggs will hatch. Um, and the caterpillar or the larvae are then active in the system. Um, and they're generally uh, active between November uh, to January, end of, no, end of January. Um, and following uh, the, the full development of that caterpillar, it will then enter uh, pupation, which happens underground um, in the ants' nest uh, at, the, at the base of the blackthorn plants. Um, and that generally uh, occurs between January to late August. Uh, where the cycle starts again and the uh, butterflies emerge. What do we currently know about this species? Um, so at this, at, at this present time, it's known only from the central tablelands of New South Wales. Um, it's approximately the size of your thumbnail, so really, really petite. Um, as I said before, so butterflies emerge between late August to very early November, and the individuals themselves are actually only alive for approximately two weeks, but the species can live or can be active for much longer at a particular site. So they don't all emerge at exactly the same time. Um, and so peak activity definitely varies between uh, sites and that can be influenced by elevation, the aspect of the site. Um, it can also be uh, seasonality changes as well. Um, so each year uh, peak activity might vary. Might vary. Uh, we conservatively just say that it's at elevations above 850 metres, um, but for pretty much all of our populations, they all occur just under or above uh, 900 metres in elevation. Um, so the purple copper butterfly, it has a really uh, specific habitat requirement. So it's only found in patches of native blackthorn. So it's actually a subspecies of native blackthorn. So it's Bessaria spinosa, subspecies Laziophylla. And it also only occurs uh, with a specific ant species. So why does this species need the ant and the plant? So when uh, the species is in its caterpillar, caterpillar form, um, it's a herbivore and the caterpillars feed exclusively on the blackthorn. Uh, so when they first hatch, um, they are only active in the daytime and they're really petite, the caterpillars. And generally one or two ants will start uh, to protect uh, that caterpillar when it's feeding. Um, after a short period of time, uh, as the caterpillar grows, uh, the caterpillar then becomes nocturnal. So it only feeds at nighttime. Um, and when it's uh, at resting during the daytime, ants actually let them uh, rest under the ground in their ants' nests, which are at the base of the plant. 
Uh, and when they uh, come up to feed at night, ants will shepherd the caterpillars up the stems of the blackthorn um, and they protect them uh, against predators such as huntsmen or wasps. Uh, and in return, the, uh, the ants receive a sugary sap um, that the caterpillars produce on their back. Uh, so this relationship for this species uh, is symbiotic. It has a positive benefit for both of the species. Um, and it's, it's actually really fascinating, as Susie mentioned before. Uh, so the purple copper butterfly is in the blues family. And actually, a lot of species have been recorded um, with ants, uh, a, a relationship with an ant species. So it's a really, really fascinating um, relationship uh, that this particular species has. And so this is just a map just to give an idea of currently our known distribution um, of the purple copper butterfly. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's definitely a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of gaps um, in our knowledge and a lot of gaps um, within the landscape that potentially the butterfly may be, um, but we just haven't found it as yet. So approximately 38 different sites across the central tablelands um, we know of at this stage. Uh, so some threats to the species. So some main threats um, for the purple copper butterfly. Uh, weed invasion is, is a big one um, for this species, particularly um, for many of the sites that are, are located um, very close to urban areas, which we see in the Lithgow um, foot slopes. Uh, so they're right on the edge um, of urban areas where, where weeds often uh, proliferate. So with weeds, uh, not only do they directly outcompete with the blackthorn, um, but they also uh, really shade in the habitat as well, um, which the butterflies love when they're flying. They love really open areas so they can bask and sun, and they're just beautiful to watch um, in the sun. Uh, so habitat loss is again a really big threat to this species across the whole of central tablelands. Um, there's plenty of different land uses um, why a lot of habitat has been lost. So not only is it the direct loss of habitat, um, but it also losing that habitat loses the connectivity um, or it fragments the populations. Um, so that really plays a role in uh, isolating populations and not allowing genetic um, transfer to occur as well. So. Uh, and the next one, uh, pest disturbance, uh, specifically for a couple of our sites, uh, feral pigs. Um, so the top photo there, that's taken from a remote camera. Um, and that just shows, uh, so that's actually a blackthorn that's been completely uprooted, um, targeted by a pig. Um, and so they've uprooted the plant to access the tuber underneath. Um, as a result, they've killed the plant. Um, and most likely if there was an ant's nest and potentially uh, caterpillars or pupae in the ants nest as well. It's, that's also been completely destroyed. And the fourth one, inappropriate fire regimes. So the bottom picture there, you probably can't quite see it very well, but in that sort of left-hand uh, bottom corner, that's a, a blackthorn that has a lot of lichen on it. Um, and we see this at a lot of our sites where um, burning or fire hasn't happened for quite a long time. So the blackthorns become really senescent or aging. Um, and as part of that, lichen really grows across the whole plant. Um, and we sort of consider the lichen is, is like barbed wire and it really inhibits um, the caterpillar's ability to move around the plant to access leaves. Um, so fire really invigorates uh, patches of blackthorn because it just re-sprouts really strongly to fire. Um, and it also provides this really high in nutrient um, uh, foliage for the caterpillars uh, to eat. So looking for the purple copper butterfly. Um, so at the moment, the butterflies are flying. Um, they love sunny days. I tend to find it's best to look for them between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Is, is probably their most active period. Um, they will disappear or stop flying um, if uh, the sun does go behind clouds. Um, so you'll definitely see a drop in activity. So it's really best if you're out looking for them um, to make sure you pick those really nice sunny days. Um, they're really restricted to their habitat. So you'll rarely see them um, beyond 40 metres of blackthorn patches. So you'll see them in amongst the, the shrubs themselves, but they also are really active um, on that open ground uh, where they're pollinating the forbs and other ground covers um, that are around the patches. So they're easy to survey. I find them really easy just to walk slowly around the patches. You'll often um, 
uh, disturb them um, and they sort of flutter a little bit and but then they really easily uh, settle down so it gives you a um, a really good opportunity even just to take a blurry photo of them um, which is really nice and they fly really close to the ground um, as well so you you won't tend to see them fly more than a meter two meters um, up in the air so yeah Um, some similar species to look out for too that might occur um, in the same habitat as the purple copper butterfly. But again, it's really important to remember um, the habitat that the butterfly is really closely tied to um, and even uh, to think about um, its behaviour as well, just how it, it is quite easy um, to follow them and watch them settle. They, they like to orientate their wings to the sun when they sit back down. Um, so the purple copper butterfly has that beautiful coloration. Remember, they're really small, so about the size of your thumbnail. And they've got this uh, sort of modelly pattern underneath. Um, so as Susie mentioned before, it's really good to, to um, look at both the underside and the upper side of the butterflies. Um, and some similar looking species that do have some other features um, that that can, uh, you can clearly identify as not being purple copper butterfly. Uh, it's a very dusky blue, very similar on the, on the upper side with that sort of coloration, slight different um, wing shapes, but on the underside, it has these very distinctive black dots. Again, with the fringed heath blue, this species looks very similar, um, but this one actually has, uh, probably a bit hard to see, but has very diagnostic V shapes on the underside of the wings, with which the purple copper butterfly lacks. Um, and then another one as well, the common grass blue. Um, again, very similar in size and in shape, but just different in the coloration as well from that purple copper butterfly. Uh, so on to the next part. So becoming a citizen scientist. Um, it's never really been easier uh, with the, this amazing uh, Butterflies Australia app. Um, so it's free, it's easy to download. Um, you can actually use it uh, where you don't have phone reception as well. So you can take it out um, into the bush with you um, and enter in sightings um, or use the field guide as well. So it's a great app to get to know the butterflies um, that are around you. Uh, so these are just some screen grabs from the, the Butterflies Australia app. Uh, so really easy to enter in um, your records and also the field guide as well. So you can actually filter by butterflies near you. So you can really get to uh, get to know the butterflies that are in your area um, or more broadly, all the species um, that, that are known to occur in Australia. Uh, and then the, the third photo on the right here is just an example um, of a profile page. So for the purple copper butterfly, um, it gives you a great idea of, of when the butterflies are active in their system. Uh, so for the purple copper butterfly, it's springtime. Um, and then they'll also have um, a description of the species and then a description of the habitat as well. And it's great. It's got an interactive map down below um, that shows where you are and then the known distribution of that particular butterfly. So more specific now, uh, the Citizen Science Project um, counting coppers as with the Saving Our Species project for the purple copper butterfly. Um, this is just a screen grab from uh, the project page, which is on the Seed Citizen Science Hub, and we'll share this um, link following the webinar. Um, and it's got all the information um, about the Counting Coppers project and a couple of short videos on how to use the app um, to record your sightings. So basically we're asking um, people to get out in, in places that they might know that the butterfly occurs, um, to enter in sightings of the butterfly. Um, but also if they, they think they might know of potential habitat, they don't know if the butterfly's there, we're also hoping um, that people might get out and have a look and see if the butterfly is flying. Um, because as I said before, we only really know the species from about 38 different locations. So there's lots of gaps, but there's lots of uh, possibility that the species might be. Um, and so why do we want this uh, science, the Citizen Science Project? So from in future years, we're, we're actually going to have um, a handful of uh, sites that are easy to access on public land um, that people can go to, um, get to know the butterfly, get to know the habitat, get to know the behaviour of the purple copper butterfly, um, and they can help us monitor these sites. Um, but also, as I mentioned before, hopefully citizen scientists will help us to uncover more populations um, of this endangered species. 
uh, which will be really important for us uh, moving forward um, to try and conserve the species into the future. Um, and I've just left my contact details by any uh, via email. Ha absolutely happy to answer any questions that anyone might have on the species um, or on the Counting Coppers project as well. Um, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Jess. That was amazing. And they are the most pretty little butterfly that I've ever seen for sure, uh, particularly when they when they sort of move in the sun and you can just see all the different shades of purple and green and brown. Um, it's it's really pretty. So anyone um, living in that sort of Lithgow, Bathurst, Oberon kind of triangle where the species exists, uh, I highly recommend um, if you're out and about to, um, to keep an eye out and touch base with Jess if you want to know some areas where we know they occur that are um, on public land so um, so people can check them out and um, and see them while they're out and about. All right, um, now the next um, section will be um, Steve Fleischman from Lithgow Oberon Landcare is going to just share um, a bit of uh, information about uh, the projects that Lola Lithgow Oberon Land Care Association is working on to help support um, the purple copper butterfly and other um, habitat and species in that Lithgow Oberon area. Uh, so over to you, Steve. Thanks, Ev, and thanks to all the other presenters too. It's been uh, really interesting. Uh, I've learnt a lot so far, so it's great. Um, hi, my name's Steve Fleischman. I'm the local land care coordinator for Lithgow Oberon Land Care Association. And we've been, since the 2019 fires, the Gospers Mountain fire, we um, got together with Central Tablelands, local land services, and the Department of Primary Industries and Environment Save Our Species program to apply for some funding with the federal government's Wildlife and Habitat Recovery Grant. So what does that mean? Well, we recognise that the fires, as has been mentioned by a couple of previous presenters, represented a big threat as an inappropriate fire regime to the, butter, the local endangered purple copper butterflies habitat and foraging capabilities. So we put funding in for um, some community days and community events and some primarily weed control because Lithgow region has um, a heavy um, broom problem. So broom is a, a weed that sets a lot of seeds, creates a lot of um, what we call monocultures. So it sort of creates this really big, dense um, sort of thickets that are really impenetrable for the butterflies to get through. So we applied for the funding, we're successful. We've been working quite closely with Central Tablelands, um, LLS and the DPIE. And we've done a whole heap of weed control with um, contractors, but we've also done some co a community day where we, we went out with some community members and did some weed control. And we've also had a day where we did some planting for some forage species. So not just the blackthorn or Bessaria species, but other species that the the butterfly when it's on the wing likes to forage from um, because one of the other things Lola also does is just general biodiversity work around the Lithgow and Oberon area. Um, so with it's actually been quite successful. We've seen a lot of the, um, uh, the broom has been knocked back so that's looking really good. And one thing I should mention here that I didn't mention before is that the post fire time is a good opportunity to knock back a lot of weeds like broom because the fire stimulates the historic seed bank in the soil. So we did see a dense thickets of broom coming up, but being able to get in there and knock it back is a really good positive thing for longer term weed management for the area. So that's a really good thing. So um, we've got a couple, we we one of the week, the community days we were going to do was actually pretty much this webinar, but in person. And because of COVID, we couldn't do it. So we that we've we, we've organised this, but we will um, come once COVID's finished. We will 
Lola will be having other upcoming projects and biodiversity. So keep an eye out through our Facebook page or at the end of this, you'll see my email address, email me. We've got planting days planned for places like Lake Pillins and Oakey Park and other parts of Lithgow. And they will be part of just general biodiversity, improving the sort of the diversity of species along the, the Farmer's Creek and other parts of the Lithgow Valley. So thanks, Ev. Beautiful. Thanks, Steve. And I think um, it's, yeah, it's a really great opportunity at the moment to get involved in, in on-ground recovery of some of these bushfire affected areas. Um, I think there's there's been an amazing response both from government with funding and from people just really wanting to get involved. We all see these threats playing out and often we feel powerless and overwhelmed by how big the problems are that we face. But getting involved on the ground with like-minded people it's not only good for the environment, it's also good for the soul and for the people involved. Um, it, it really helps us cope with, with what is a very, very difficult environment. And of course, COVID has made it harder to connect um, in person and, and get around and get out to these places. But um, thankfully, we have technology that allows us to still learn from each other and, and connect and Hopefully, uh, before too long, we'd be able to, to get out in person again. Now, that actually brings us to the end of the, um, the formal part of our um, presentation. And um, I've popped up a slide that's just got um, the contact details of myself from Central Tablelands Local Land Services as well as Jess and Steve, um, for those of you that would like to get in touch. Um, we'll also be sending around an email um, with contact details and some other resources, links to things like um, the Counting Coppers information and, um, and links to how to get in touch with, with, um, with Sandy as well from Bush Care Blue Mountains. So um, that will all come around, but if you do want to touch base with any of us, just um, drop us an email or um, send us a text or give us a call. Um, now I'll just hop into the chat. I, it has uh, occurred to me that it seems like some people may not be able to um, to type into the chat. Not quite sure why that is, but for some reason I can't, and there's at least a couple of other people that can't. So if you have a question and you can't put it into the chat, then firstly, I will apologise profusely. I don't know how to fix it. Um, but you are more than welcome to email it through to any of us and we will do our very best to um, to answer that and might even share it to everybody that's been um, that's been registered for the webinar so they get the benefit of the learning too. Um, but there is a couple of questions in here, so I'll just um, go through them. Firstly, one for Jess from Bernadette. Um, Jess, the question is, um, do those butterflies that are similar to the purple copper butterfly, are they also the same size or are they bigger or smaller? Yeah, thanks, Ev. Um, thanks, Bernadette. That's a great question. They're all generally very small. Um, there might be you know, sort of a mil, two mil uh, difference between the sizing, but generally they're all quite small, um, yeah. So Jess, just, just further on that, when you're out in the um, purple copper butterfly habitat looking for them, what is the thing that makes you know there and then it's a purple copper butterfly? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. I think because I've spent a lot of time, I've really been able to to 
I guess, get my eye in, um, which is definitely something that I, I would recommend to everyone um, is to visit some areas. But for me, it's the size and the behaviour. So I see that it's it's in association with that habitat. Um, and I see that they, they really seem to disturb quickly, but then they settle quickly and they open their wings up. Um, and that beautiful coloration and the shape of the wings. Because um, some of the other species, whilst they do uh, do superficially look similar, once you get your eye in on exactly um, what they look like, it's it's really easy. Yeah, it's a tricky one though, because a lot of them do look very similar. Um, and I generally say as well, if it's just a flash and you, you're not sure, but you sort of see the coloration, I wouldn't count it. I, I, that's one one trick to learn is if you're unsure, it would don't count it, yeah. Can I just yep. jump in quickly with that one? Absolutely. Um, for those species, the underwing is is quite different. So they're very dusky blue, you know, on the forewing, they've got those lovely distinct uh, dark uh, circles and it, and the common grass blue has quite a different underwing again. So as long as you can get a good view of the underwing, separating out those species suddenly becomes much easier. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, and I guess I'm I'm only new to the butterfly world and one of the things that I found really distinct is that that dark flash of of this shiny colour that um that you see when they open their wings, even if they only open their wings for a short time. It is it is just a, a an amazing kind of quality to the colour that, that comes off when the sun shines on them. Absolutely beautiful. All right, let's see what the next question is. Uh, the next question is from Ian, who asks, what species would be expected to live in the Capity Valley or around the lower parts of the valley? I'm not sure who might like to attempt to, um, to answer that. Is that something you're across, Jess or Susie? I could probably, I mean, I'm not across what species would occur in the Capity. What I what I could suggest is definitely download the Butterflies Australia app because there is a great filter that you can use um, that it filters nearby to you um, and that'll give you a good list of species that are likely to occur in your area. Um, so some of those similar species to the purple copper butterfly are quite common um, across the central tablelands and across that eastern area of Australia. Um, but yeah, definitely, Ian, if you can, I'd download the app and, and flick on the nearby me uh, filter that will really help you uh, learn the butterflies around you. That's great. I, I did download that app uh, the other day and I, I couldn't stop looking at all the beautiful photos. It's absolutely stunning. And for someone who hasn't spent time learning and understanding the butterflies around them. It is, it, it, it's very, very much worth it. It's an awesome resource. Um, beautiful. Now, Cian, um said to Steve, she'd like to uh, get involved with land care and um, also is interested to become a um, citizen scientist. And I think um, that's not really a question, but it is, really a, a big big invitation to everybody who is interested in um you know, getting involved in any capacity get in touch with us um and i think it, it's really important to remember that even if you feel like you might not be able to um to help planting or weeding or any of those really physical um, things still get in touch because there's always things that anybody can help um, there's there's plenty of jobs, Steve. It, yeah, I, one thing I neglected to mention when I was talking before, and this is not just for CN, but for anyone who's in the area, we also run a couple of times a year a frog monitoring program um, along Farmers Creek. So um, where we go with one of the SOS guys down to the creek and we record what frogs we can hear and we have a number of sites along the creek and um, we've collected a whole bunch of data over the last few years and we'll continue for the next couple of years to collect data on what frogs are around and at what time of year we should be doing it sort of the next few weeks but obviously that's not going to happen but as soon as we can come out of lockdown we will be arranging another frog monitoring evening and they're always really fun because you just go and listen out for frogs 
So uh, a little bit different to obviously butterfly monitoring. Uh, I suspect one probably eats the other. I'll let you guys decide which one does that. But that's a that's a really good way to get involved. Um, like Ev, like you just said, we've got planting days. That's that's often one of our biggest things is planting days, simply because um, a lot of the landscape needs more trees and more plants. It's a, a really simple equation. The more the more trees and plants we get into the landscape, the more birds and the more other species and the insects that come through, and it becomes like a self feeding sort of loop which we're trying to create so in terms of getting involved contact us through either Facebook or by email or my phone numbers there always happy to have a chat and we've got a few other interesting programs as well coming up as well so we're sort of doing some some work with grassy box woodland as well so beautiful yeah. thanks heaps Steve and uh, now Ruth has a really good question um, there probably for you Jess um, if you have a patch of blackthorn that is covered in lichen, should you burn it off in winter? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, it's definitely it's something that with the Saving Our Species project, um, that's one way we're looking as a tool to improve habitat um, and definitely is best and recommended to be done um, when the the species is in its pupation phase underground, so a, a burn will definitely reinvigorate that habitat um, at the right time. Um, and then in a few years following that, um, potentially at the site where the butterflies are, uh, there'll be a boom as well in population, considering the, the regrowth of the habitat. And um, you guys have experienced that with, um, with a burn that has been undertaken, haven't you? Oh, so that burn, so we haven't yet burnt um, the management site for SOS, but LLS have previously, they did some great work. And yeah, I think this year they've had some really, really good numbers. So, which is awesome. Yeah, I guess the, the thing that we do need to keep in mind when we um, look at applying fire to, to a site is that fire can make the weed problem worse which is what Steve was talking about um, so we we do need to really be ready to manage weeds as soon as possible after fire to allow the blackthorn the space and and resources to to regenerate as well as it can and um, and then the the butterflies will follow um, and it's probably a, a good moment to actually share with everybody also that we've been um, we've been out just recently surveying um, the known sites that have been impacted by the bushfires um, in the summer of 2019-20 and apart from two sites I think there's there's 11 um, sites that we've been surveying. Apart from two, we have now found butterflies across all of the sites. Uh, the, the two that we haven't found them, we actually are not 100% sure whether the butterflies were still active um, and around before the fire. But, um, but the ones where we know there was butterflies, they all still are there, So um, which is really really reassuring to see because the fires during summer can be problematic because the butterflies or the um, caterpillar can still be active and if the timing is wrong um, it can quite definitely cause local extinction of the species so we're quite relieved that um, that that hasn't seemed to have happened at least to the majority of the site and it's really lovely to also see the blackthorn regenerating and the butterflies starting to really increase in numbers um, at one of the sites that Lola has spent a lot of time and effort managing and we've just had contractors um, again manage the broom. Our uh, consultant who's been out there um, monitoring has said he's actually never seen as many butterflies active in such a small area which is just amazing to know. Um, so they're, they're, doing, they're doing okay with our support, which is really nice. Um, now there is another question from Lillian uh, that asks, what is the best field guide for butterflies of Greater Sydney or New South Wales? 
Um, Susie, is that something that you would like to answer? I'm unaware of any uh, specifically for Sydney or New South Wales. Maybe somebody else knows it. The best, the best field guide I find is Michael Braby's complete field guide and sometimes he will have uh, flight seasons by month for say New South Wales compared to Queensland if that's the species distribution um, so that might be helpful uh, but apart from that I'm not sure of, of a specific Sydney or New South Wales guide. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah I'm I'm the same Susie that's all I've got is the Michael Bradbury as well so maybe another one to consider downloading the app to and flicking on the, the nearby me at least to start with. Yeah, that's a great idea. We will um, we will share the details of that field guide for those of you who prefer to have a um, a book in the hand to look at the butterflies. But yeah, the um, the Butterflies Australia app again can um, can really help you narrow down what you're dealing with. Beautiful. Now, um, if there is no other questions, then um, I think it becomes time to um, to wrap up the webinar. I'll just um, open it up to the speaker is, speakers. Is there anything that you guys wanted to add? No? Beautiful. Well, that brings us to the end of the webinar today then. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the speakers and those that have joined us today. Um, I hope that everybody got something out of today. I certainly did and I think there's an amazing amount of knowledge here in this virtual room. Um, as I said earlier, we, we have recorded this webinar and we will share a um, a recording with you, a link to the recording um, once it's all ready and ready to go. Um, we'll include some links to different resources that we might think uh, you find interesting and also a, um, a short webinar survey so that you guys can provide um, LLS some feedback um, and hopefully we will be able to um, hold some more webinars and, and further our knowledge about butterflies. So um, thank you everybody really from the bottom of my heart. It's been an amazing um, hour and a half and um, I will now close the meeting and um, thank you all again. Thanks Bye. everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining.